Hello, everybody. Thanks and welcome back to our uh, monthly appointments with the Edinburgh meetings. Um, Co-hosting with me tonight are Mike Spencer and Karim Rivera, uh, which I don't know if you can see. I don't even know if you can see me, but anyway, I hope you can hear me. Um, so it's been a long seven months since our last meetup, and I'm very, very happy that we uh, finally found the time to get back together. Oh, there's Karim. Hiya. We finally found the time to get back together and uh, organize these. And I'm particularly thankful to Red Hat, who, uh, which is offering the, the platform uh, so this is possible. So we are now on, I think, Blue Jeans, and uh, this, is, this is nicely offered by, by Red Hat. And um, well, without further ado, let me introduce uh, quickly our two speakers for tonight. The first one is not a new speaker for those of you who have attended uh, any <laughs> Edinburgh our meeting before. Uh, so Greg Sutcliffe. Uh, Greg is the community data scientist for Ansible and he does a lot of stuff there. So I won't even get started on telling you what he does uh, but what he is is a very strong open source advocate and very passionate our user and um, tonight he will tell us something very interesting about the way that uh, his company is tackling the very sensitive issue of uh, preserving and encouraging diversity and reviewing the language that we use in in our lives and in our jobs to, to improve uh, over over mistakes of the past, in a way, if you want. Uh, the second speakers will be uh, Melanie. Uh, Melanie is a senior lecturer uh, in biomedical sciences at the University of Edinburgh, and uh, she's uh, big on computational modeling and simulation to understand learning and memory. So um, uh, this is going to be very interesting. I'm really looking forward to uh, to her talk as well. So uh, we will uh, get started with uh, Greg. Uh, as per uh, our program, uh, so uh, and we will then move swiftly uh, to the next speaker, and then we will have question at the end. So if you have any question, feel free to uh, ask them in the chat. Mike will take care of uh, collecting them so that they can be discussed at the end. Okay, Greg, the stage is yours. Thanks, Federico, and thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be able to offer um, the Blue Jeans platform to our group. Um, you know, ours open source, Red Hat's all about open source. We're, we're quite happy to, uh, to to try and support that, um, so that's fine. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm going to be talking um, tonight about the Conscious Language Project within uh, Red Hat. Oh, we can make that a little bigger, I think. Uh, how about there? Um, so, um, so the disclaimer is there's not a great deal of R in this talk. Um, I will have some. I promised a bunch of packages. Um, the, the actual um, sort of technical complexity of what's being done is, is not hard. It's um, the scope that is the thing, right? Um, and so, uh, so I will do what I promised in the abstract. I will show you these useful packages that have enabled me to put some together fairly quickly. Um, just to give you a quick kind of kill kill the anticipation. Um, oh, hello. Um, apparently, using page up, page down doesn't work while you're in an IO slides. Um, Thing. This is what the dashboard actually looks like, right? Um, so we'll get we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so yeah, let me let me start though with the story. Um, let's let's start with the why, shall we? Um, because I think it's important. Um, this the, the the project here is about it's called Red Hat's calling it the Conscious Language Project, and the idea is that. Um, for some time now within open source, we've had this awareness. Um, people have been telling us that certain words make them very uncomfortable. Um, most notably, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, uh, on the list are blacklist and whitelist and master and slave, which comes up a lot in network topology. Um, but these words have a different meaning in different parts of the world. And for a lot of people, it makes them very uncomfortable. Um, and it's, it matters, right? It, it turns out this matters an awful lot. Um, and Red Hat committed to, to, to doing something about that this year. This is not a new problem. This has been around some time. It's been talked about and batted around for some, some years. Um, but this year has been somewhat of a transformative year in many ways. Um, and, and it came to the fore again. Uh, and Red Hat decided that it was going to jump in on this. So our CTO, Chris Wright, put out a blog post. Um, I'll, I'll put these slides up uh, for Federico um, when we're done. And so you can go and click on these links. But he wrote a very long blog post about why this matters um, and why it's important. And just took one sentence out of it about how, you know, for open source to be inclusive, it must be welcoming to all. I can't think of um, anything less welcoming, to be honest, to, to, be, to be met with 
uh, with words that, that remind you of, of bad times in your own culture, right? Uh, that's, that's not nice. That's what Red Hat committed to do. And I'm super happy. Like the, the technical side of this is not hard, as you'll see in the second half of the talk. But I'm super happy to be involved in it because this is making a difference to a non-negligible fraction of the world's open source. Red Hat either directly controls or has influence in a very large amount of code bases. Um, and, and so to be, to be part of that project, it, it, it makes me super happy because this stuff matters. Right. But what I'm going to start with is some stories. Um, I'm going to put to you the three arguments that I've heard against this and why I don't agree with them, because I think it's important that we talk about that and we know um, where the pushback comes. Because this, as I say, has been batted about for years. Um, and these arguments keep coming up again and again. And I just want to dispel a couple of them, um, because I hope that if you take this forward and you look into your own open source uh, and the communities you work in, uh, if you do, um, I hope you won't meet any of this resistance. I hope I'll convince you that this is a good idea. Um, but if you do, at least you'll have some arguments uh, to help. So the first one that comes up um, is that people don't want politics in their technology. I see this all the time in open source. And to, to try and illustrate why that is completely wrong, I'm going to tell you a story which is a little bit uh, of a tangent. Um, it's actually more about data privacy um, than, than the use of language. Um, but it still illustrates that Technology is political. Um, this is absolutely like you can't separate the two. Uh, if you don't know who this person is, um, this is Rene Carmille. Um, and that behind him, or in front of him, I guess, is a punch card. Uh, Rene Carmille was the head of the French census. Uh, our censuses are good things generally. They, they collect useful data for governments to make decisions that benefit their citizens so they can put their resources to the right places. However, René Carmille had the misfortune to be the head of the French census during the Second World War. And when he saw the Nazis come in and what they were doing with census data, he felt that he had to act. And his, he and his team certainly engaged in and possibly invented the concept of ethical hacking. Uh, what he did was he took the punch card machines that were used to record the census data and broke them in a very specific way. He made it so that column 11 would never get punched. It didn't work. Column 11, it turns out, um, is the column that stores religion. And then when the Nazis came looking for the Jews in France, they couldn't find them because the census data didn't exist. Now, René and his team were found out. Uh, they were hunted down. Uh, René died in Dachau. Um, it, it was a bad end for him, but he did a great thing. He saved an awful lot of lives with that act. Um, in fact, if you look at the statistics, I think in Netherlands, the death rate was something like 70% for the Jewish population there. In France, it was just 25% because they couldn't find them. And the point here, I don't want to make this too much of a downer, although it's obviously a, a very, very detailed and depth story. And if you want the whole thing, there's a lot more to it. You can follow the thread uh, from, from Heather Burns, the, the links at the bottom there, um, because there's an awful lot more to it. Um, but it just illustrates the point that your technology is political. The tools that we build get used by people. And it's very difficult to separate the two. And certainly, if you do anything to do with personal data, you owe it to yourself to know this story very, very well and to keep it in your mind when you're working out what to store, um, because things things get broken. Um, so my point with this story is simply to say, look, your, your technology is political. You can't say keep the politics out of it, because it's already there. Um, and and I, I don't really care what sort of open source you build. That there is an element of that. Uh, and so I don't really accept this argument at all. If you're if you're not thinking about how your technology is used or where the politics is, stop building it, please. Uh, it's not going to help. So that's point number one. The second argument that I hear a lot is this one. Um, again, if you don't know this image, this is George Orwell, 1984. Um, and the argument is that that trying to police language uh, is is thought police. It's new speak. It's taking words away from the language. And again, I don't agree with this. Uh, if anything, it's the opposite. If you read 1984, uh, the idea of Newspeak was to remove words so that you didn't have a way to describe what was happening or what was going on. Uh, and th this is not theoretical, right? I actually saw this happen in the UK this year. I believe it was in January, but certainly earlier this year, the UK government tried to ban its ministers from using the word Brexit uh, in the hope that people would stop talking about it. Um, so, so this is a, a genuine tactic, right? Um, but in this case, it's not true um, because we don't want to stop people using words like master slave or blacklist and whitelist. We just want to restore them to their context. If you use the word slave, it ought to bring with it all of the imagery that goes with slavery and all of the horrible things that that entails and make us think about that and not 
lead us down a path of talking about network topology. It's, it, it, it's, we've got other terms for that. We, we should be enriching the language with terms that are appropriate for the context that they're in, right? Um, and, and leave those other terms to where they belong. So, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with the fact that we're trying to destroy language or trying to police language. We are ask, uh, suggesting that when you write a piece of documentation or some source code or whatever, maybe think about what the words you choose to use uh, and maybe have some empathy for the people who might come to that project later. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, it's not about trying to destroy language or to take words away. It's just about trying to make sure that their, their context is understood. Uh, so again, I don't agree with, with that particular um, interpretation. The last one is more practical. Um, so the, the one that I hear from, from engineers around me quite a lot is, well, why should we put effort into this, right? It, it takes effort to change these things. And, and a, few, a few people I know have asserted Hitchens Razor, uh, which, which is there for you, what you can assert without evidence, you can dismiss without evidence. Um, that is true to some degree, right? If someone comes into your community and says, these words make me uncomfortable, they can't prove that, right? Um, it's, it's a fundamental uh, subjective feeling. And, and one of my very good friends who happens to be on the other side of the fence uh, from me on this one was uh, very clear that he could not understand why he should make a change, right? He could not, to put it in a very engineering sense, he couldn't reproduce the bug, right? Someone's raising an issue saying change these words and he can't reproduce that issue, right? Um, because he doesn't have that cultural background. And so um, the problem here is I feel that it's looking at it from the wrong angle. And we know from decades of study that more diverse groups make better decisions, right? You, are ha you have a healthier community if you have more diverse voices in it. This is one of the most unintuitive results of psychology is that if you take a group of experts and a group that's got some experts and some lay people in it, the second group makes better decisions, right? Massively unintuitive, but very well studied. Um, so if you want a healthy, good decision-making community, then you want these people involved. And I think my colleague Rich Bowen put it best. I'm not going to read the whole thing out, but basically what he's saying is you can't you can't make something more unwelcoming than ask people to justify their experiences. But rather, if someone tells you that's, that, that this word makes them uncomfortable and that isn't necessary, that you have perfectly valid alternative words to use, then the burden becomes, why would we keep it? We're going to improve our community by by changing these things. And it's not a great deal of effort in most cases. Yes, okay, there are some projects that have very long lifetimes with lots of backporting. Um, and you know they've got lots of, sort of deprecation systems and APIs to go through and it's all a mess. But most projects don't have that burden. And so you ask yourself, why would we keep it? Right? I, he, I was chatting with him this afternoon and, and he said a telling thing. He said, the, I get the resistance to change, but it feels like people are fighting to hold on to the problem, which is weird. Um, and, and I totally with him on that one. I think he's absolutely right. And do you know what? Even those projects that are big and hard and have long lifetimes, like you know the Linux kernel, um, are making these changes as well. I mean, Linus Torvalds is not known for being the most agreeable person on the planet, for all that he is <laughs> very, very impressive for the things that have been achieved. Um, but even the Linux kernel is now changing this and recommending that they stop using these words now. Um, so this is not a small movement. It is not a minority movement. It is happening. Um, and I do, I certainly in the case of things like blacklist, which happens a lot in kernel space, right? Um, that That's going to flow, right? People are going to use what the Linux kernel uses. And I think that's an amazing change. I'm so so pleased that they did. Um, uh, it, it's just great. So I've spent probably 10 minutes there talking through like my, my motivations, like why I think this is important, why I think the sort of key arguments that tend to come back aren't really valid. Um, that's not to say I would deny people's experiences. If they feel that way, then fine. Um, equally, I don't think we need to, to abandon our critique of reason, right? If, if one person comes in and tells me that the word mushroom is annoying them, I'm not sure I'm going to go and change that in my project. Uh, but if I'm getting, if I'm hearing consistently from multiple places that this is an issue for people, who am I to question that, right? Why would I keep it? Again, we come back to Rich's comment. Why would I keep it? However, I don't think you came here for moralizing. I just decided to add that to the talk anyway. Let's actually look at some code. So I promised you five packages um, that have enabled me to build something fun. Um, and we're going to go through those. Uh, so first of all, let's have a quick look at the results. This is the current dashboard. To give you an idea of the scale of what we're dealing with here, I have barely scratched the surface. And there are 1,200 repos uh, currently indexed here, I think. So 10 per page. And yeah, it goes well. 
there's a lot. I think I strip out anything that's got zero accounts. So it's like, yeah, 900 odd repos, and I've barely got started. Uh, so there's, there's, there's much to get through. And the idea here is that, that the community teams within Red Hat use this to start working out who to reach out to to start trying to reduce that. So you can see, like, top here is Seth. And I know we're already talking to Seth. I'm not going to call them out. They're already trying to make changes. In fact, they already are making changes um, because, uh, oh, okay. oh, no, history doesn't work its tables. I'm, I've only got, like, three weeks of the data. So, you know, there's not much to see in the history yet. Um, but if I go here, it's like, you know, you've got Seth here, 34 down on last week and so on. So they're, they're already making changes. So how did I build this thing, right? This is a this was put together in about a week and a half, first cut, and I've been sort of tidying it up thereafter. And I did that because I know of a, quite a lot of our packages that you can tie together in some kind of loose fashion uh, to make something useful. So the actual core dashboard is Shiny. I have done loads of talks on Shiny. I know you're all sick and tired of me talking about Shiny. This is not going to be a talk about Shiny. Uh, you'll be very glad to hear. It is going to be a talk about how we generate the data that Shiny is displaying here. So let me switch to my R Studio session, and we will go through all of these packages. Right, so here we go. Uh, R Studio, it's this one. Okay, can I just get a confirmation that you can see my R Studio session? Yes. And, yeah. and Fantastic, thank you. People putting it in chat as well. Wonderful. Okay, so the way I tend to structure things like this, that this is this is a project that runs on a separate server to where the shiny dashboard is. So there's actually a network layer as well. Um, it's because the, the the work that it does, as you'll see, is quite intensive when it runs, and I don't want it to slow down the the, the shiny dashboard for like half an hour. Um, so I don't. Uh, I don't want it running there. So I have a separate server that runs this. It runs it once a week at the moment because whilst it only takes half an hour now, I anticipate it's going to take a lot longer when we start indexing the 8,000 repos that are in git.centos.org and things like this. Here's how it starts. We're going to start with, we're going to see five scripts. Four of them are run on a regular basis, which is um, the sort of cron uh, update once a week. And the fifth one is an API script that allows the dashboard to get what it needs. So this is the first one, 01 get repos. What is this one? This one's all about Google Drive. If you work with Google in any way, which Red Hat does internally, uh, we use Google Apps, um, it was very natural for my colleagues on the Conscious Language Project to dump everything into a spreadsheet when they were starting to figure out which repos they needed to look at. And so obviously I wanted to consume that. And so I did. And the Google app, the Google Drive package will absolutely do that for you. It's by Jenny Bryan. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it can do just about anything you want to do with Google-related things. Um, so by all means, go out and check that one out. I just download it here as an XLSX, and then I use Read Excel to have a look at it. And then you can see I'm, I'm taking a couple of columns here. So we've got column five and column four and column six, now, which happen to be the list of repos, a list of organizations, because GitHub can obviously have organizations, and I can just get everything under that. Um, and column six is the exclusions, things we've already looked at and decided we don't need to deal with. At the end of that, we have... Uh, a single list of repos, we're gonna put that into a data frame. That's going to be just a nice long list of repositories that we can clone with Git. And then we come to the pins package. Uh, I'm hearing background noise. Is that you, Federico? Um, so I'm going to unmute that person. Uh, right, so um, we then we come onto the pins package. So the pins package is really nothing more than a glorified write RDS, uh, but it's got some nice features to it that make it a little bit more useful than that. In particular, you can pin to more places than just the local file system. So if you were just working on your local machine, then write RDS would absolutely be a perfectly valid approach here. But with pins, you can pin to GitHub, to S3 on Amazon, to Kaggle, to wherever you want to pin things. Now, I am actually using the local file system. You can see here uh, that I'm caching it in slash temp. Um, but there's reasons for that, which are nuanced, and I don't have the greatest amount of time. But in any case, if you need to move data sets around, if you need to make data sets available to colleagues, um, then pins can be a really happy package to help you do that. And in particular, if you do work in Shiny, I know I said it wasn't a Shiny talk, um, pins can make Shiny reactive so that when a script updates a pin, Shiny notices and refreshes the appropriate parts of the dashboard. That's super useful. Um, so um, that's one of the reasons I like it. Uh, so check that out. Okay, um, so by the end of this script, we have a data frame with a list of repositories in it. Now we need to get those on disk so that we can actually go looking for instances of these words in there. And that's where we come on to clone repos. So first of all, we're gonna, we're gonna load up the pins. So pin get, we'll get it back from where I cached it at the end of the last script. And then we do some, we do some just basic string manipulation here to kind of get a bunch of things. So don't worry too much about that. 
the fun starts about here. Now, I promised I, in my abstract that I would talk about Git to R, but unfortunately, it turns out Git to R doesn't support one feature that I really, really need, which is shallow cloning. I don't care about the history of the Git project in this instance. I just want to know how many words there are now. And to save disk space, I want to be able to do this here, depth one, um, which Git to R sadly doesn't support. Uh, so I can't show you the Git to R stuff because when I submitted this abstract, I was still using Git to R, and now I'm not. Should Git to R add that support, I will go back to it. It is a lovely library for interacting with local Git repositories, so you can clone and push, pull, create branches. Um, it's quite nice to be able to sort of automate um, some of your Git-related tooling. Uh, so check that one out if you're doing a lot with Git. Uh, but otherwise, I can't say too much about it because the one thing I need it for it doesn't work. Much more fun. Let's talk about fur. This one I love. So. If you think for a moment about what we're going to do here, we've got a list of Git repositories and we want to clone them all onto disk. That is an embarrassingly parallel task. Official terminology, embarrassingly parallel, means there's no interaction between any of the tasks, right? And so we want to be able to do this as fast as possible. I'm assuming most of you, or at least some of you, will have heard of the per package from the tidyverse, which allows you to do a map over a data frame, much like apply for a list. Um, per goes one step further and allows you to do that with your um, oh, hang on, I've got a private message here. Federico's probably telling me I've got five minutes. Oh, seven minutes, all right, fine. Um, so, um, you've got, so we can make use of multiple CPUs. So we've got four workers, and we run it through future map now, and that basically just splits it off into four tasks, four R threads, and clones them as fast as possible. I can't go more than four, I run out of memory. But, but if you've got more CPUs, you can speed this up, obviously. So, um, so that goes and clones them all onto disk. I make a note of the failures in case I want to look at them, and we pin the results of those Git clones. So where are we at now at the end of script two? We go have another pin, which has got all of the results in, and we've got the actual Git repositories on disk. Then we go and scan it, which follows the exact same idea. So again, we're going to do a pin get uh, to pull it back in from the end of the last script. Uh, and the, one of the reasons I do this is so that if anything fails, I know roughly where it failed, right? Because one script will complete, the next one won't. Um, we have a function to count the words, yada, 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 not, not very interesting. This is the fun bit again. So we do another multi-process plan, less workers this time because the, the, the counting words is um, intensive. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. So I'm just going to create four new columns. We're going to run count words for an appropriate regex. Um, and we're done. And when we're done, we pin that back again. So we've now used Google Drive, pins. OK, not used git to r We have used fur and, and future underneath to do some parallel execution. And then finally, we just store it, which is not very interesting. Um, we're going to use the Google Drive package again to push a backup, um, just in case my server explodes. Um, and that's about it, really. So that's the four scripts that run once a week. That generates the data set. One of the things it does, as you can see here, is it generates the history. So it, it, it does a subtraction of last week to this week. That's not easy to regenerate, which is why I take a backup you'd have to check out a Git repo at a certain date stamp, which is, turns out to be annoyingly hard to do. Um, so, um, so we want to store that. We don't have to regenerate that. OK, now I've got a data set. But this is still living on a different server to where the Shiny app is. Um, and so finally, we need a way to get at it. And that's where Plumber comes in. And if you ever want to do anything over the network, Plumber is amazing, because it is a way of turning an R script into an API. Um, so don't worry about this. This is just. Uh, a startup stuff, but the, the real fun starts here. So we have some um, some Roxygen markup, uh, which allows us to define an API. Um, and then we just say, where is it? So we're going to do a get on slash search. And then the, uh, the code follows. So my shiny dashboard will make an HTTP get call to this server on an appropriate port. Um, and then this is what will happen. The, the, the shiny server will send a repo and a word, and it will go and run um, the word search. And what that allows you to do, um, I'll switch back to my um, desktop, my, my browser in a second to show you, it allows you to get a live kind of how many counts per file in that repository, which is super useful for community managers. Uh, and that's really, like, that's the only actual function that happens over the network, because you have to have the files on disk in order to run that, right? The, the Shiny server can load the pins for the for the summaries, and then it's got it in memory. It doesn't need the back the background server after that, but for the live stuff, it does. So I'm going to quickly switch back to my browser. Where are we? Is it this one, this one, this one? Here we are. All right. So um, do that. Good. Uh, so basically, what that enables is something like this. So if I can I can pick a repo. I'll pick my own repo. I used to be the community manager for this project, uh, the foreman. That's foreman. 
and we've got blacklist and the search button is disabled these days. And there it goes. It goes. So that what you just saw there was it calling out to the back end server, hitting this plumber API, the plumber API doing um, ag, uh, sorry, ag over the form and repo and returning the results back to the shiny dashboard. Nice way of separating the concerns. If this server were to crash, if you were to try and DDoS me by putting really big repos into that search, then yes, the background server will crash, but the shiny dashboard won't care in the slightest. It'll just keep running and that, that feature will be disabled. Um, quickly, um, I'll put these links out later, but here are the packages. So there's Google Drive, there's Pins, there's git to r there's Fur, and there's Plumber. They all have lovely pages with lots of examples and things you can go play with it. Um, and I think I'm almost out of time, so I'll just put my uh, my thank you slide up um, and make that a bit bigger. And um, yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope uh, that uh, you'll make uh, similar thoughts about your own projects. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Greg. You actually took less than what we thought. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, so as I said, we'll keep the questions for when we finish. So I would uh, kindly ask you, Greg, to uh, stop sharing the screen so that Melanie mm -hmm. can share hers if she's ready. You, hello. Melanie is still muted, and so I was going to say I was born ready, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, the stage is all yours, Melanie. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, here we go. Can you see this? We can't see your um, your screen right now. Hold on a sec. You cannot see my screen. Oh, okay. Let me try this again. Can you see it now? I can't. Okay. Going to try and share my entire screen. Can you see this? Let's try something different. Okay. Um, try and close your video. I want to see if that is by any chance okay. taking up the whole feed. Uh, but no, it's not that. Which browser are you in, Melanie, uh, out of interest? Um, Firefox. Oh, that's what I was using. Did I go to a different one? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. It should work fine. That's very odd. Um, OK, so we could try and do these. Uh, just quickly send via mail your presentation. We'll, we'll share it. One of our Ah, that is very clever. OK. Yeah, and then we'll just. We'll, do the, we'll play the next slide, please, game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, Apologies we can do that. This. With this, but uh, it was actually strange well, that no technical issues were. <laughs> well, shall I answer? Shall I answer Mike's question? I'm always while, happy while to provide the technical issues. <laughs> okay. Uh, working as I do in Red Hat, I always like to say that if technology worked perfectly, we wouldn't have jobs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so let's let's all be thankful. What I'm going to do is send it to Mike because I have Mike's email. Yeah, it's fine. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. So while we wait, I say we can take the time to have uh, maybe Greg answer a very, very tricky question by Mike. That's a very uh, Mike, good question. You know, how do you handle your own imposter syndrome when speaking about diversity as a white male? Good question. Very, uh, very good question. And the answer is it's really hard, right? Um, because I don't experience these things. 
I now turn my video back on so I can be properly empathetic. Uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't experience these things. Right, I have not been through that background. Um, I am as white and privileged and male as it gets. Right, about the only thing you can say about me is that I came from a working class background and not a rich one, and that's it. Um, so yeah, it's not easy. Uh, and I think the only way you can do this is is to listen. Right, it's about empathy. It's about it's about when someone tells you something, believe them. They have no reason not to. I genuinely don't think that there's a very large number of people coming into our communities and trying to cause trouble by saying things they don't really feel. Um, it's it's just it's it just doesn't make sense, right? Um, and so when people come to you and say, "Hey, this is a problem," then then we need to believe them um, because I think that's the only way we learn anything. And certainly, my own experience is um, bear in mind that that before I came to R uh, and data science, I was a community manager uh, for one of Red Hat's projects, and and I learned so much by hanging around at events and talking to people, understanding why things like codes of conduct matter and why um, people care about how you organize your events and where you hold them um, and whether it's a dark alley that gets to the conference venue that they have to walk down afterwards and things like this. It is a whole minefield for a whole bunch of people who are not like me and the world is a better place for having them and I hope I can do a good enough job of trying to be an ally and not just shouting over them. Uh, and that's also a difficult battle. Um, but I'm trying, I want to learn, I want to be better at it. And I think that's all you can really ask of people, right? Yeah, I think that's very sensible. Uh, one thing that we 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 always we always do in this in these meetings is to talk about coding and R and everything. But I, I think it's very, also very important that we touch on the ethics side of the thing because I mean, it was interesting, I forgot, I forgot to mention this in the talk, but it's interesting, isn't it, that in science we have ethics and in technology we don't really. Um, we don't talk about it anywhere near as much. There's no training for it. There's no like, and privacy as well, like uh, the, how we handle data. It's not something that's talked about much. Certainly from my background in pure technology and coding and web development and stuff, um, you don't ever talk about that. And that's just wrong. <laughs> it's just completely wrong, but I don't know how to fix it because most people who learn to code aren't coming through like a university program. Mm. So, um, so it's tricky. It's very, very tricky. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer. Mm. Okay. So, uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Greg. So, it looks like the uh, Mike, Mike got the presentation, and we should be ready. I think. Let's see. Okay, I can see Melanie. Mike. I'm fairly certain it's not moderator only, and even Mike's a moderator, so yeah, <laughs> did work. I, I'm currently sharing it, but or at least sharing just the window. Let me try and share the whole thing. But it, it says uh, it says I'm receiving I'm your screen. This on to, really um, something's very strange here. Um, just glad try sending it. Just send it. Send it. Well, I mean, I clearly can send it to me. You've got my email address, right, Mike? Uh, no, I don't think I actually have. Well, let me put my slides back up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll put it. I'll put it in our private chat. Angle. Sorry about this, folks. I don't know. I, I, this so blue jeans is what we use internally at Red Hat, and um, and I'm used to just running like simple meetings with it, right? Um, I know we can do lots of fun things with it. This is the first time I've actually tried. Um, so uh, so I'm still like um, figuring things out. I'm sure it will be much smoother next month. I'll, I'll just try one last thing. Melanie, please check your messages and try okay. and access through that link there that I gave you, which is slightly okay. different one that you No, have. Mike's the moderator anyway, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah but. OK, I've sent that on. All right. Thank you. So I'll any other that. question for, uh, for, for Greg in the meantime? Mike, are you happy with this reply? Yeah, yeah, excellent. And I, I feel the same thing. I was recently interviewed for a podcast and and spoke a lot about diversity, but I didn't feel it was my place. But it's all our places to speak up about it. It's just a very difficult thing to do. Can you see my screen now, by any chance? Oh, no, sadly not. It's happening. No, steal your something, there's something odd. I wonder if it's something to do with like the first person who shared or something like that. I definitely enabled some protections so we don't get like the so-called Zoom bombing. Um, uh, 
if people come in and just start randomly screen sharing things. And and the checkbox in BlueJeans is like once somebody screen sharing, you can't take it over. And um, but I'm not screen sharing at the moment, right? So so it should be possible uh, according to their their documentation. Um, but for whatever reason, something's not quite right. Anyway, I have just received a PDF from Mike, so I will okay. get this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, up and running. Let me down. And apologies for the hiccup. Yeah, these things. First, run, first time problems, right? Right, <laughs> right, 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 yeah, yeah, it happens. Right, save that. Uh, um, sorry, I don't have real file browsers, right? Because I'm used to working on the command line for most of my life. So, <laughs> uh, right. Oh, stop messing about, Chromium. Come on. Right. Sorry, guys. I am honestly, okay. I am actually a competent like programmer. I promise. Um, right, here we go. Here we go. I have an actual PDF and everything. Why won't you display this? You strange thing, is it? Ah, there we go. That's it. Uh, okay, right. Uh, this one? No, nope, that's Thunderbird. That one. There we go. How's that? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Fantastic. Right. Okay, please, Melanie. <laughs> okay. So I feel the build up to this has been so long now that um, I can only disappoint. Um, but that is completely fine. Um, so this talk is not going to be very technical. It's going to be about um, teaching R. I know some of us um, have to or, or want to teach R. And um, one of the questions that it comes up is, how do we design assessments that are meaningful um, in some way? And I'll define what meaningful means a bit later. So this is the title of my talk. The subtitle is, if we could have the next slide, please. Some things that went okay and some things that very much did not. So um, what happened is I taught an R course last year. I tried to um, do what I'm talking about and design and produce some meaningful assessments. And some of it went really well and some of it very much didn't. Could I see the next slide, please? Um, so this is the background. So I work at the University of Edinburgh, but I really teach at the Edinburgh Judge Young Joint Degree Program, which is all the way in China. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, it's not always snowy, um, but it always has this nice bridge. The course is taught in English. Most of our students are Chinese, but not all of them. And we are teaching there um, two undergraduate honors degree programs, one in biomedical sciences and one in biomedical informatics. For both of them, um, we try to include um, data science, statistics, and R into the teaching throughout the course. For biomedical informatics specifically, we have a course that's called Applied Data Science II. And that's a compulsory course that they take in their second year. And what it re is, is really, it's an introduction to data analysis and R for people who have programmed before, so we can make use of their programming skills to do things like run simulations of, of data sets or things like that, to sort of build their probabilistic and statistical thinking, and then formalize that um, into statistics teaching and statistical methods teaching. And it's a course with a biomedical focus. So all of our examples we take from biomedical sciences. So we will often, you will see, we'll talk about mice and, and viruses and things like that because it is a biomedical informatics degree. Next slide, please. Really what we wanted to do um, for assessments is we had several constraints um, for what we wanted in the course. So one thing I wanted is I wanted assessments that cover the breadth of what we learn, so different techniques, different statistical methods, um, different ways of dealing with data. But we also wanted to go into depth with at least some of the assessment. We wanted to have the assessments be tasks that are in some way similar to what a real person would do in real life, right? So. If I am on the job, um, I will never have to fill out a multiple choice exam. Um, and I hope I will never have to do this again in my whole life. 
um, except if we take the life in the UK test, but we can cross that bridge when we get there. But other than that, we don't usually typically in our professional lives do multiple choice exams, so we wanted um, assessments that kind of reflect that, that are similar to real life tasks. What kind of tasks do I do in real life? Well, I do, I would say, two kinds of things. One is the kind of task where I have a research question that I look at in depth. I have a data set or several data sets, and I really have to do a lot of analysis and a lot of thinking, um, formulating hypotheses, um, and, and really looking at this um, question at a lot of depth over several weeks, seven months. And the other kind of thing that um, I do a lot is kind of small tasks that have to be done rather quickly. So visualizing one data set for a presentation or for a report, um, doing a quick analysis on, on a small data set. Um, so, so these are the kind of two kinds of assessments that we wanted in there. And we also wanted to give students an opportunity to work in a group. We have the next slide, please. So the first kind of assessment is really this um, several kind of small um, tasks, but in a short amount of time kind of assessment. Um, so what we wanted to do with this is we wanted to cover a range of skills that I have learned throughout the semester or throughout the year. Um, we, we decided to go, <laughs> I should say I decided to go, for an open book coding challenge. So what that means is the students get four problems, um, four data analysis problems. They get two hours in total um, to answer those four questions or to, to work on those four problems. Um, and at the end, they have to submit a PDF that was knitted from our markdown. They have two hours in total to do that. They can use anything um, they need to look up their um, commands or anything. They can use books, notes, um, code that they have previously written. They can, can even look things up online because that's also what I do, right? If I have to run a quick data analysis, I fortunately don't have to rely on my memory of R commands because I would be so screwed. Um, so I can look at what I've previously done that was similar. I can look at notes I have. Um, I can look on Stack Exchange. So we wanted to give the students the same opportunities. The only thing we don't allow for this particular assessment is collaboration, so they have to do it on their own. Um, so what happens, um, I mean, what happened last year is that they just, just all sat in a lecture theater with their laptops in front of them and, um, and worked away on their own. Um, this year, it will probably be, um, due to COVID, the same thing, but at home. Um, the marking of it was um, 100 points in total, so they would get up to 20 points for each of the four problems, and then another 20 for um, the R markdown part. Did that work out correctly? Did they manage to, was the syntax fine? What does the overall presentation look like? Next slide, please. Here is an example, and because I'm such a good teacher, I have a slide with a lot of text. <laughs> I thought um, it might be useful to just see one of those questions in action. Um, so I'm just going to read this question out to you. That's about the side effects of medication. And the scenario is that a researcher is testing a new drug for mood disorders. And on top of testing the drug itself, it's also important to test for possible side effects. And one of those possible side effects is weight gain. In order to study this, the researcher weighs each mouse in the treatment group before the beginning of the experiment and again at the end, and the difference in weight is recorded for each mouse. The positive difference means a gain in weight, and the negative difference would mean a weight loss. And I provide a CSV file that has the data. So we have the next slide. And then there are really three questions. So first of all, they have to plot the data in some meaningful way that they can choose. Um, they have to answer the question of whether there is weight gain in um, mice that have been treated with the medication. Um, so what they would do here, um, I mean, the um, straightforward thing is, is a um, one sample t-test. Um, they have to, of course, look at the data to see if it meets the conditions for a t-test and otherwise choose a non-parametric alternative. Explain what they're doing a little bit in the report and then do the actual test. 
And then the third question is naming and explaining one way in which the experiment could be improved or one possible direction for future studies. So this is just to get them to think critically a little bit and evaluate the actual experiment um, to show that they're not just plugging numbers into, into R, but they can do like at least a little bit of, um, of critical thinking as well. So this is one example. And they had four questions like that in this assessment. Could I see the next slide, please? So how did it go? It did not go well. So this is the overall mark distribution for all of our students. Um, you would think that a 67 or so median is not actually that bad. Um, in China, it is. So in China, our students will typically come and complain to us if they get only an 85. Um, so clearly, this is very much below um, expectations. The pass mark is 60, so we have quite a few students failing. Almost a third, I think, of the, of the cohort um, was failing this particular assessment. So clearly, something was off. Um, clearly, this did not go um, as well as I expected. It was kind of possible to do well. So we have one student who got a 90, which is fine. But clearly, um, a lot of students struggled with this. So what I wanted to do next, could I see the next slide, please, is really to figure out what went wrong. And by that time, um, the COVID pandemic had started. So I was not able to go and talk to the students in person. But what I did is um, I um, dedicated a um, tutorial to this question. And because it was an online tutorial, they basically receive a discussion prompt online and then can engage with that prompt in the discussion forum. Um, can I see the next slide, please? So this was the discussion prompt, and I, I tried really to um, to make it very detailed, make it an opportunity for self-reflection, but also an opportunity for me to get some information about what happened. So this is what the prompt reads. This is an opportunity for you to reflect on open book assessments, your preparation, and how you might go about assessments like this in the future. Reflect on some or all of the following questions and share your thoughts on the discussion board. So the questions were, what are the advantages of having an open book assessment? What are the disadvantages? What did you do to pre prepare for this assessment? Um, would your preparation have been different if it hadn't been open book? Can we see the next slide? Um, the next question is, you have a lot of information um, relating to the course, lecture slides, notes, code. How do you organize that information? How do you find information when you need it? Did you look things up online? Um, was that helpful? Did you use some of your previous code? How easy was it to reuse it? Do you still understand what you did then? Um, and then um, positing sort of an alternative scenario, if this had been the kind of open book assessment where you can't bring everything, but you can just bring, let's say, one page of notes, would that have changed the way you prepare? Would that have been better, less good? And what advice would you give to a student preparing for their first open book coding challenge? Um, and how will you prepare for the for the same kind of assessment next semester? So what I was trying to do here was, I thought, very clever. I wanted to kind of sneakily instill a bit of metacognition, so have students reflect on their own learning because um, you read in all the books that that's really good and that makes students better learners. And then I also wanted to kind of get some feedback on what they did to prepare and what they found difficult what maybe I could do to support them next time. Could we have the next slide, please? So this led to a very lively discussion. And when I say a very lively discussion, I'm lying to you. It was <laughs> no discussion at all. So there was one student who um, posted in that discussion forum. I'm going to share the full content of that post verbatim with you. Could I have the next slide, please? Yeah, it was basically just um, a GIF of Will Smith dancing. <laughs> there was absolutely no comment on that. I have no idea what the student wanted to tell us. 
Um, was she trying to say that a dance-off would have been a better type of assessment? I don't know. Um, but this is the only kind of feedback that I got. Um, could I get the next slide, please? Um, so I had to basically guess what I think the problem was. What I think the problem was was um, really twofold, but they're related. I think part of the problem was time management. You could see that a lot of students struggled to finish the task. The way that I had um, the way that I had prepared the assessment was that I had written all the questions and then I locked myself in a library and timed myself while doing the actual assessment. Um, and I did it in one and a half hours, and then I made it what I thought much simpler. Um, but this is, of course, not a good way to gauge that because I wrote the assessments. I knew what was coming. I, I think I overestimated the amount of content that they had to deal with. The other thing is that I think they underestimated what it took to prepare for an open book assessment. Um, this was the first open book assessment that they did in their whole course. And as a student, you may be tempted to think, well, if you can bring all my stuff, then this is going to be easy because I can just look stuff up. But looking stuff up actually takes a lot of time. And you really have to be very strategic about knowing what to look for and where to look and how to plan um, your work, how to manage your, your time. So I think it's a combination of those two things. So if you could have the next slide, please. Um, so knowing all of this, um, I'm going to introduce some changes this year. So we're going to address the question of preparedness um, head on. And we, I have introduced a, a lecture slot that's dedicated to that, how to prepare for open book assessments. So that um, maybe that will give them a range of tools that they can then use. We're also going to have a practice assessment that's not graded, but where they will be able to get feedback and to just try out what that's like um, to do something like that in a timed manner. And um, I will probably also give them more time or have them pick three out of the four questions. Um, and I'm kind of on a fence about which of those two I want to go for. So if in the discussion afterwards someone has any good insights into, into this, I would be very interested. Can we see the next slide, please? Okay, now to something completely different, um, and this is the assessment that actually went well. Um, so the second type of assessment in this course was a group exercise. So the idea here was, whereas the coding challenge was really um, looking at the whole range of things that they had, had learned in the course, the group exercise is, is an opportunity to go more in depth on a particular problem, to work in groups, to use real world data, whatever that means, but no toy examples of someone measuring 10 mice that I made up, but like actual data. Um, and to um, and what we did was we gave them a data set. We had a few set questions on that data set. And then um, once they have re responded to those questions, they were given a prompt to ask one additional question of that data set and then to use whatever they need to use to answer that question. Um, they had several weeks to complete this, and they um, then submitted this as a group. And they were also marked as a group, so everybody in the group um, got the same mark. I just see my five-minute warning. Thank you very much. Um, could I see the next slide, please? The data set we gave them was, of course, a COVID-19 data set. Um, and the first task was um, getting this COVID-19 data set from our world, the data.org, which is absolutely beautiful data. It is so cool. Um, and what they had to do first is to um, identify all the countries that had a certain um, threshold case number or over and plot those in a kind of meaningful way. Um, certainly better than I did here. Um, you will notice that this was back in March when China was the country with the most cases. Um, this has changed very drastically since. 
um, which was also something that the students could explore because by the time they had to submit it was about one month later so they could actually see how um, how this changed over time so we see the next slide please this is what one of our group decided to do as the additional question so um, as the additional question they were really free to do whatever so they could come up with a hypothesis and address it using the COVID data, or they could find um, an interesting way to visualize the data. Um, and what this group um, decided to do, group A, um, and I, unfortunately I can't credit the actual students because the marking was anonymous, but um, if you hear this, anyone from group A, you did well, thank you. Um, so if we could just um, go through the next few slides kind of quickly. But it looks like an animation. Yeah, so this is um, kind of a map of how COVID spread over, um, I think, the course of a month and a half or something. And this is quite impressive. It's quite nice. It's a nice example of where students kind of were creative and came up with a thing to do on their own. Right. In this case, there wasn't necessarily a hypothesis, but it was an interesting way of visualizing data. There were other students who looked at how. COVID um, measures um, coincided with socioeconomic measures, for instance. So they got human development data out of a different database and then tried to combine those and had some kind of hypothesis about um, um, the, uh, the wealth of a country and the COVID situation, which turned out to not be a thing. Um, so there is no correlation there, apparently. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, that's basically um, all I wanted to tell you. So the things that I took home from this course in general and from this assessment experience was um, the students really enjoyed assessments that are close to life. They much rather have a problem to solve, work on data that they find somehow interesting and meaningful, than do yet another multiple choice test. Um, but those assessments need to be extremely carefully calibrated. Um, and then the third thing that was kind of a surprise to me, more of a surprise to my students, was that open book assessments are not, in fact, easy. Um, I think this is very important, though, for us faculty, is that um, we really need, if we introduce a new form of assessments, we really need to prepare the students um, to set them up to succeed in those assessments. Because I think the students who failed didn't fail because of the R or the data science. I think they failed because of the format of, 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 the, of the problem, and this is absolutely on me. So thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Melanie, that was extremely interesting, and I think that uh, there is lots of us that at least the work in academia can, can relate to this kind of struggles. And uh, so is there any question? Um, I see a question from Greg, actually. So would the Tidy Tuesday site be a useful practice resource here? What do you think? Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah. Ah. Yeah. It'd be good to share. Also, thank you very much for, um, <laughs> for moving through my slides. That was very helpful. No, you're welcome. That's fine. It just it occurred to me that, that the picking of any particular data set, much like your problem of like whether you pick three out of four on the assessment, is that going to lead to mm -hmm. some bias there? Um, obviously, people are going to pick the ones they find easiest, but maybe that's fine as long as you know it's happening. But then equally, the thing we tell you Tuesdays is there's lots of reference material. Like if you pick a site, you can go at one of the data sets, you can go back in time and see what everybody else did, right? Maybe that's inspiration, maybe yeah. that's plagiarism, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think as long as there are um, guidelines about what to do with inspiration you get online, um, how to, for instance, how to credit it, um, I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I guess people... Because that's also what we do, right? We, we look at what other people have done um, and yeah, get yeah. inspired that way. Like proper citations. Yeah. Um, Federico, so yeah. there was one question uh, further up from Joe for me, um, which I'm happy to take. Okay, sure. Um, so, so Joe asked if there was any examples of um, dodgy language um, for things like sexuality or disability and so on. Um, I don't have any great examples for those two things off the top of my head. 
not say they don't exist, of course. Um, I will give you one that's related. It's sex rather than sexuality. Um, in one of the community, one of the bigger communities at the moment, they're trying to figure out whether they should do something about people using the word guys. Like turning on going, hey guys. Um, this is something that's quite close to me. I do that a lot, right? That's something that's just normal in my culture. And it, 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 where I come from, that is a genuinely inclusive term. It includes everybody. But that is not true for the rest of the world, right? Um, and so they're debating whether or not to, uh, to have a bot or, or, or something, which can be very personal. It can be tricky. People can react badly to that if a bot says, hey, maybe don't do that. Um, in my own personal life, I'm trying to replace that with, with the word folks, which I think is slightly better. Um, so uh, so if you catch me saying, hey, guys, tell me off, because that's one I'm working on. Um, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they, they're definitely out there. Um, but yeah, I'll th one thing that Red Hat is working on and, and plans to share, we're probably going to get it into a Git repo sometime soon, is our kind of working guidelines around this, like document, not documentation, but you know, documents around the words that we are trying to change and why we're changing them, um, as well as the, the code for the dashboard, if anyone wants to run it like for their own set of projects and rather than bothering me. Um, so, so hopefully that will be out sometime soon. And when it is, I'll definitely be like tweeting about it. So. Okay, brilliant. So thank you very much, Greg. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, oh, Rebecca suggests say hi, guys, and save yourself by throwing in uh, and gals. Well, but that wouldn't be very efficient, would it? <laughs> it's also not good for the transgender folks, non-binary. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. exactly. It's tricky. It's tricky. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so if there's no other question, then I say we can uh, we can wrap this up and thanks everybody for uh, for joining for this first virtual uh, meetup and thanks the speakers for two very very timely and extremely interesting talks and thank you very much. Thanks, Mike and thank Karim you. for co-organizing and helping behind the curtains with all the technical issues. See you next month. Thank you. Bye. Bye.